tady zvenka. A já se teda pokusím to překládat. Zahodu. <laughs> okay. Um, last presentation. And I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about what my research suggests is the fastest growing field of community economic activity, certainly in Northern Europe. Shows the, the newest and most active sector of economic development. Which is this repurposing cultural heritage. And I'm going to show you, second thing, some examples of interesting community development. So, repurposing, what word are you going to use? Okay, that works, yeah? yeah. Okay, repurposing is, I have had, in the last three years, I have had three research projects with native breed horses, old traditional boats, old, yeah, old boats, and this is old farm buildings. And I have also done research into these as well, but we will concentrate on the first three. And what I discovered is they all have something in common. And that is, is that each of these things, each of these activities uses cultural heritage asset. But they're not big cultural heritage assets. But every community has within it some heritage, cultural heritage. And every Everything, whether it is, let say, old horses or old boats, let's say this is old boats. It has three parts in its life, three phases. The first time, it's invented to make money. And it is the best way to make money. Like the traditional rowboats and the fishing. They were the best boats that could get the most fish. And then they got and they could, um, they would not tip over in the big storms. And the fishing industry in, say, 1850, where there was all this technology of old boats, no less exciting than this technology now. Jako nyní, když máme mobilní telefony, tak jsme z toho prostě rozrušení, nebo jsme z toho... Přijde nám přijde nám, ta technologie je zajímavá, tak stejně tak byla zajímavá pro rybáře, ta technologie starých plodních v té doby. It's the same with the horses. To samý s koňma. They were bred 
to be the most efficient helper uh, of the farm. Byly chovány tak, aby byly to ty nejefektivnější pomáhači hm, na farmě. And every time you made a new horse, you hoped it was a little better. <laughs> a pokaždý, když se narodil nový kůň, tak se doufali, že, že bude opročičku lepší efektivnější. And these became what we now know as native breeds, like Shetland or. A přesně takhle se dovedlo vlastně v konci národní kmen, na který máme, my máme třeba kladovský okoní, nebo šetlandský okoní, ten na Shetlandě. To nemáme my, na Shetlandě. But then a new technology came along. Nicméně potom přišla nová technologie. What we like to call now disruptive technology. Kterou v konci nazýváme. Yeah. Yeah. In the case of the boats, it was internal combustion engines. Actually, in case of the horses, it also was internal combustion engines. For example, Shetland ponies and Farrelly's ponies used to work in mines pulling the Například Shetlandské koníky nebo koníci z Ferrojí uh, ostrovů tak byly chovány proto, aby tahali uh, vozíky z dolů. A po druhé světové válce byly koně nahrazeny mokrámi. Každý z těchto věcí jde určitým cyklem a do druhé fázy All the fishermen just leave their boats on the shore and get new ones. Yeah. And those boats rot. And a few people go, oh, we have to save them. And they go in the museum. Well, they don't put horses in the museum, but That's a bit different, but, yeah. but now, whether it's old boats or old horse breeds, communities are taking those old assets and using them for new 21st century economic activity. Yeah? Does a, takže komunity, nebo organizace v komunitě teď začínají využívat tyto zdroje, tyto místní zdroje a vlastně je používají na to, aby vytvořili aktivity, které produkují ten ekonomický um, příjem. I will show you. When they do this, what they do, they use these assets, it promotes local identity. Když ty místní zdroje, ty starý místní zdroje používají, tak vlastně um, And it's particularly they they have they get young people involved in these assets. So they use them for education, for social work. And you are talking about the youth. No, I'm just talking about the assets, the old boats, the old horses, the old buildings. Yeah. For tourism, yeah. For outdoor recreation, I was telling you about a community forest yesterday. It's used a lot. I mean, in this community forest, I'll show you pictures after. They use, they do outdoor recreation, they do tourism, they do social work with teenagers. They have forest classrooms, and they all they get paid by the local government to deliver education. Uh, 
and they get paid by a different part of the local government to do social work. A jsou zaplaceni z různých zdrojů uh, od státu, aby argonce používají uh, no, sociální problémy, aby pomohli se sociálními problémy. So these, if you think about it, in the beginning, these things were part of the productive process. They produced food on the farm, they produced fish out of the sea. Then they get put in the museum and they become like art. Pak uh, se dostali do muzea, kde vlastně byly součástí, no, byly to, bylo to umění. Now, they come back into the economy. Teď se nadáce zpátky do ekonomiky. And in the 21st century, what is the most important economic sector in Europe? A v 21. století uh, nejdůležitější ekonomický sektor v Evropě? Services and consumption. Služba a spotřeba. So now they, they are used to support services and consumption. Services like education, consumption like tourism. <laughs> you see what I'm saying now? You can look to find your own. For example, in Norway, there is 100,000 empty barns. They are a hundred years old. They are made out of wood, sometimes very loose. And they are all falling down because they are no good for modern agriculture. You know, a, dairy, a dairy with ten cows. Mm, no good anymore. Yeah. So we had a project in Norway to find new uses for these old buildings. It was called Livafjöse, which means living barns. And so one community built a preschool for children in the barn. <coughs> there is a culture center, a restaurant on a tourist trail, there was a school for woodworking. So, 12 different uses. For the old buildings. So these old, very beautiful buildings became repurposed. For the 21st century. So you, you can think of your own assets, your own community, your own farm, your own community. It's like, uh, you know, in Norway we have the fjord course. Yeah, the fjord has to be in Now they used to be, they're, all the farmers still have them. But they use So now they're trying to use those horses in tourism and equine assisted therapy. Takže teď tyto koníci jsou používány při samozřejmě turismu a green care, they're like we were talking about uh, yesterday. A při péči o no, hypoterapii. Yeah, farms for, yeah. So every one of these assets goes through this. Každý tento zdroj, o kterém Maric mluví, šel takovou nepřítku. If you look at horses, pokud se podíváte na koně, the, in Europe, the most biggest population of horses was around 1930. 30. 30. 30. By 1960, the population of horses in Europe declined by 92%. 
There were more horses in London in 1932 than there are in Europe. Because nobody could make money with the horses anymore. So they stopped breeding horses. And so the lowest level was about 1962. And since 1990, the population of horses in Europe is growing 10% a year. As people find new economic uses for these horses. So again, they were for production, then they disappeared. Um, they weren't in museums, but they were in breed centers. So, you know, and now they come back. So this is what I say. Let's take the boats out of the museum and put them back in the community where they came from in the first place. Or the horses, or the barns, or the whatever. This is, and the really good thing about this is, it is about trading income. It's not about getting government grants. So, for example, in Scotland, there I knew a community that had a harbor, fishing harbor from 1600. Uh, yeah. Old, old harbor. In 1990, the Scottish government said no more fish can go there. They made the fish And so the people said, oh my God, what do we do? So they decided. To, they purchased, they bought their harbor from the government for one pound. Yes. And then they started the Scottish Traditional Bow Festival. Last year was the 21st year. And there was 18,000 people came and they paid 35 pounds each for tickets. <laughs> so I said to these people, oh, you know, there's people in Norway with old boats. Do you know them? No, 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 no. So I go to Norway. Do you know these guys in Scotland? So I started the North Sea Ring with one Scottish, with that Scottish harbor community and one Norwegian. Because historically, the traffic across the North Sea the Vikings, the Scottish herring industry in the 19th century, all of the boats were built in Norway. Because Scotland was a country. And from Norway, the boats came from, they were built in Norway, fish in Scotland, by Scots And we are, we are talking about a trade of over 1,000 boats a year. 
a, a mluvíme Pink o obchodu, obchodu tisíce lodí každý rok, kdy byly prodány do toho So, come on, let's, you know, let's start talking to each other again across the North Sea. This is the statement. The North Sea Ring is a group of like-minded but different organizations and individuals coming together from the countries around the North Sea. Uh, 
There's also another interesting. These skiffs, they're called the St. Isles skiffs. They were designed specially by a naval architect. <laughs> As a kid. That, that, that school children could build. It, it, you designed specially by a naval architect. So for 3,500 pounds, a school can buy the whole kit, the wood, the design, and then the kids work together to build the boat. Yeah, it includes the wood. And everything you need. And it's easy to build. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a very good rowing design. So now they have regattas from community skiff rowing, and then you know you get the what they call like to see this pink boat. This is this is this team is called the Porsoy Quines, and Quine is a Scots word for woman. So it's just my my point is you have women's groups, you have young people's groups, you have local. Over 250 of these kits have now been sold as far away as New Zealand. And they come to Scotland for once a year for a big competition to get together. <laughs> so again, this is a traditional style of boat. Old fashioned. Made new. It, it uses marine plywood, not the. Uh, Brought into the 21st century again. Another example in Norway. Tak, kdyby, kdyby měl představu, že pojede na lodi, tak to 
But now we work like this. In Stavanger, in Norway, there is an organization called Engle Holma. Yeah, it has 18 old boats. It has huge wooden buildings that they got for nothing that the city was going to destroy. So they said, no, no, we will take it. And they floated them to this island where they have their... So they have two islands. Yeah. Now they make their money by they have five recovering heroin addicts who are taking boat building apprenticeships. Now these guys. And they get paid by the social work department who takes care of drug addicts. Because it's a successful therapy and it's actually cheaper than putting them in hospital and giving them the They also offer two after school classes to primary school kids. And they make little things, and it's they're they're in amongst the boats. And again, they get paid for the This is this is their main one. Their one of their two buildings. That was a touch screen. Um, yeah, and so you can see they rebuilt this as a, a net. Drying shed, you know, where the fish are. And they own this boat, this boat, but not that one. <laughs> I mean, they own, and you can only get here by boat. There's no bridge. So you kind of stand there and go, hi, hi, and they come with a rowboat. And uh, they're very, very successful in what they do. They so, even, they have another, their other building, they, they, they get this huge, big wooden building, moved it to the island, and a year later it burned down. So very successful in what they do. It's the same thing that they were able to build on the island, and a year later it was destroyed. 7,000 square meters. 7,000 square meters. Big, big, beautiful wooden building built like a boat, you know, with the curve. Yeah. So they managed to get the insurance money to rebuild it, and they rebuilt it. And besides having places to build boats and sails and masts, they have a 150 seat cafe with a performance space. Which they rent out to the public. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this is the place where the performance is. The, this is the new. This is the new, the new uh, And what they did is they cut down the trees in a forest far away. They towed them all to that island. They set up a portable sawmill and cut the trees to build the building right on there. Yeah, right on the spot. Now, this organization, this type of organization, is not unique, but is special. There are many volunteers. People who love old boat building. Lots of old men. <laughs> There's a few old women too, though. I mean, this is Norway. 
<laughs> but then they also have seven paid <laughs> And it is that integration of volunteer charity and economic activity that makes this phenomenon so useful for people. When you have the volunteers, you can say, ah, we have community. Nobody can say you don't have community. Look at all this work that people are doing. At the same time, you can then say we also have a professional staff. And this is important. It's things like people who used to be teachers. Or nurses or yeah, who, who, who don't do that anymore, but have bring their skill into the community. So there you go. There's 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 one northern or Norwegian example. This is just a quick I'm gonna just take you through a couple of examples now quickly because we're time is going. This is the community forest that I was telling you about. Yeah, yesterday. In the Briaken. Yes. <laughs> um, there's a welcome to Briaken sign and there's an art sculpture trail through the forest. And you can see the pathways, the signs that you can walk. There is a trail called the Great Glen Way. Sorry. A trail, yeah. a walking path called the Great Glen Way. What is Glen? Glen is the valley. What is it? Scotsky and Dunbury. Yeah, so Scotsky and Dunbury. Yeah, it comes to start. The point is, they bought the land before the trail was made official. But the trail now has 60,000 people a year walking it. And it comes right past their land. So then, of course, you see the signs. Oh, come in here to the walking up, and they bring people in. You can see that's Loch Ness, and you can see how high up the mountain they are. Yeah. And that's the they got they built a forest classroom. And in fact, this is the forest classroom. And so students from all the schools all around come here for one day a week and learn about biodiversity or little kids. And they employ five people. The forest and nature when they're little kids, maybe they do art. This was built in 2008. And already demand is so high they have to build one more. So this is one example of taking those assets. And turning them into not only economic, but yes, economic. But also to bring the heart into the community. When before they had this, the, the community of Ebriaka had suffered 50% population loss. Total, like, you know, like from 1968 to 1990, you know, like 
And it was only old people left, all the young people who moved away. And that has changed. Yeah. Because there is this. I have a. One of the things they did is they involved their children in the planning. So the children designed where the walkway passed. So there is no vandalism, there is no graffiti. Because it belongs to the young people. I'll never forget this the daughter of one of the people, a friend now. Come, 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 come look, come look. And here, here is a post on the pathway. Post. Yeah, like a wooden post. With a button. And it has a carving of a bird. She's like, press that, press that, press that. And it's her recorded telling you about the bird. So, you know, like, this, yeah, it's like her saying, you know, the black headed woodpecker lives in these trees, it's a native of Scotland, and she's telling the story of a bird. Post or post. They, 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 they put a little digital player in there and you press the button. No, 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 we were just thinking what was the purpose of that post, it was like. Or just for the birds. No, no, it was just it was for the birds. It was yeah. because Not they had got some biodiversity money for saving birds. And you walk 50 meters and there's another one with another child of another bird. And so these kids, their sense of I am from Bleak, that's my home. And I'm so proud of this place. It's amazing. So it's not just economic development that we're talking about. We're talking about the spirit of the community. And its future, because we're talking about the children. The other things that they use, uh, any questions about that, by the way? Um, Anybody want to ask any questions before I move on to the next example? Okay, this is normal. So the money comes from the national government to the Filkus Commune or the county, the regional government. And then private people come together as So they were born owners. Do they have to define what particular parts would be referred, or they get money for twelve? Um, no, they had to. Yes, and there was an architect involved as well, which the project played the architect. And that was a waste of money, actually. The architect was a waste of money. Yes. Because you said that architect was responsible for what does somebody in Oslo know about a bar in the north of Norway? Oh, we'll have cappuccinos in the you know, uh, uh, That was actually, that was a, a mistake in that project, to pay 2.5 million kroner to an architect. The money has should have gone to the people who own the bars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
tak existuje finka, to je klasický svaté, je to bílý a jsou z toho kamery. Jo, to je to question. Reasoning behind the question is that in an ostrich experience, not cheese, but she knows all the farms, about all, all farms. Yes. Jo, a když se podíváte na sled zpátky, tak oni v té krajině nebyli, oni to si měli opravený a chtěli. A potom vlastně vláda byla to samé. To znamená, že byla opravená fikanty, dáma vám o to přispěl. Ale to je special kind of farm. Um, if you shouldn't, you wouldn't be, it wouldn't be possible for you to find them 10 years ago in the Austria, because those farms were all, those farms were reconstructed in some certain way. Nobody cares in which way. Then uh, the Austrian government decided that those farms should be safe and reconstructed in the old way. So, so just because of the, the landscape, um, the Austrian landscape, uh, yeah, yeah. looks so different just because of the project. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. The, the danger is in this that if you get UNESCO designation or something like that, you can't change. Yeah. Trochu jako nebezpečí v tom je, že pokud dostane třeba ten status UNESCO, tak už nemůžete udělat žádný změny. They will, do, you know, and that's a problem actually, because you know, the past is history is always about change. But now they don't want it to change. You change it too much, they visit, they say, oh, we'll take away. I mean, it, it influenced if people will apply in it. In terms of speech? No. Because most of the activity is voluntary. And people simply keep doing it. So what do you use the money? That's what I'm just going to say. <laughs> what we call this was a knowledge exchange project. Between, and so we had three communities who were experts, one in tourism, one in education, and one in social work. So the grant application was to hold three workshops a year for three years where people came to these experts to work. Three workshops in three years. Three each year for three years. Okay, so three workshops every year. So, in the first year, they heard the idea. In the second year, they tried the idea out themselves. And in the third year, they would get feedback and fix the rejection said very good project enthusiastic team we have no more money <laughs> so we try again thanks I mean, this is the thing. This wasn't a boat building project. This was a knowledge exchange project. Which is the language Erasmus Plus understands. So our job, we're translators. We translate what the government wants to the community. And what the community wants to the government. I mean, every government civil service person has targets. I'll, I have enabled 3,500 people to 
So I say, okay, if you give these people 60,000 euros, you get to tick. Not only that, but these people will do this themselves. No government employees. They will do a good job because it's, they own it for cheaper. And, and they might even vote for your boss because they're happy. So that's a win-win. You know, and as a development, as a rural development contractor, as a rural development officer, I see that as my job. Is to stand between community and government. And they found that even more effective is when children are doing the activity in the nature. Yes. Um, they connect with generation, youth with, yes. them, um, youth with parents or youth with grandparents. I have a dream of a, of a project right now. It's about food. And it's about old traditional food, cultural heritage food. And there is a whole generation of old people who still, whose children live in the city, but the old people live on the family land somewhere in Eastern Hungary. And those old people do not participate in the European cash credit economy like their children do. And they still grow food. Like when they have been growing food, like their parents had it on the And they preserve the food, the harvest. When those people die, there is just a lot of really important knowledge that might disappear. Knowledge that's really important for young urban professionals who want low food miles, food Knowledge is really important for primary school children to understand where their food comes from and to be So I want to try and find European money to do uh, something that we call Children's Voices, Elders' Wisdom. So I want to work with schools and have children go and interview these old people and honor them and learn all of this food knowledge. They bring it back to school and we help them turn it into curriculum material. And then we turn that into a European database of information about traditional that or you know organic consumers can use. That's my next my next one. I'm up for that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And of course that's because this food is part of a culture economy. And uh, you know, they include so many things like that, like food, like language in Scotland, people come. That's McDonald's Galway. Um, people 
people come and take, you know, people from Nova Scotia come and take uh, Gaelic language lessons. It's a big, big earner in the summertime. And people come and learn to play Scottish traditional music. And in the Gaeltach, which is the area where they speak Gaelic, um, this is really, there's a lot of activity because they also put it in the schools. There is this thing called the Fashion Movement. And it's all about young people learning Gaelic culture, not just music, but how to speak Gaelic. And it's in all the primary schools and secondary schools. So if I was organizing this in Scotland, I would go to the school and hire young musicians to come and play in the evening so we have a cake. I say, if I was organizing this here, our stop of the So that's another cultural economy thing, the way they work. I mean, language, music, dance, food. Yes, Great. Well, this is the last thing I want to do. Yeah, no, uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, I wasn't checking my uh, Facebook account when I was saying <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was looking at my clock. Uh, what a change, you know, when people always used to wear watches, I never... Mm. One of the most important assets <laughs> of culture is stories. And I, I said that before, didn't I? I mean, yesterday or the first day. But I'd like to give you an example. I did a project in uh, in Highland Perthshire in Aberfeldy. In, in Highland, Scotland. And in the mountains, are very empty. There's no trees. It looks like this, and it's mostly like this. And uh, the, the tourist providers did not make very much money. So we came. We got this project to get the stories because in these hills, the farmers. Crofters would dig a little hole and put in a whiskey still. Yeah, the crofters, yeah, they would do that. And they would do that on the mountain. And of course, that's so they didn't would have to pay tax. <laughs> so they would make the whiskey over the um, summer when they were up with their cows in the hills for the yes, summer transfer months. Yeah. And then they would put it into barrels and load it on the horse and they would lead their horse over the hills down to the lowlands of Scotland to sell this whiskey into the pub, you see, because there's so amongst the Scots, these are called the whiskey smuggling trail. So in the project, we went to all the landowners and we got and this other people, we got all the stories, and we wrote up a little pamphlet, a book about whiskey smuggling in the hills. And we, and we gave these to all the hotels and B&Bs and tourist bureaus. 
And within two years, Angola, a bed and breakfast could charge 15 pounds a night more. Come to the whiskey smuggling trail. They were only charging 20 pounds before, so they got nearly 50% more money. Just by putting the, the story. So this is stories, narrative. It is really important. I mean, you and your neighbors and your community know it, and other people don't. Takže i právě ty příběhy jsou strašně důležitý, nemusí to být jenom hmatatelná věc, kterou, kterou, by, kterou by si vysněte, ale vy víte víc než kdokoliv jiný, uh, nebo kdokoliv jiný. Vy víte o svý komunitě víc než kdokoliv uh, tady komunitě není. And that is the definition of an economic asset. That you have something that, that somebody else doesn't, so they can aid you. Tohle je uh, definice to, toho ekonomického zdroje, že vy máte něco, co ostatní nemají. There, there you go. I rest, I rest my case. I keep saying the same thing over and over again. It's just different ways. Who cares? <laughs> the tourists go. The American tourists go home and they go, Oh my God, Martha, did you believe what we did on our, our we were in Scotland, we were on these whiskey smuggling trails, you should have seen it. Whether it's true or whether it's not. They have the story. And when it's controversial, when somebody says, no, that's not right, that's even better. <laughs> And they do this also with movies. They do movie trails. Jane Austen trails, Shakespeare trails. All the <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, whiskey is really good. Yes, it's. So, we can have, can we, do we have Silo Lisa trails? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a work. <laughs> so, listen, thank you. Uh, well, that's me done here, and I think we're just about going to come to this end now. Uh, it's, you've been really, really an interesting group to work with. Like, there's nothing worse than when I say any questions and everybody goes, <laughs> you know, I am not a TV screen. <laughs> so you guys are really doing great because you're not treating me like a television screen. This is about So I, I would say, you know, thank you, first of all, from me. But also respect that you came here and you're treating this seriously. And you're treating it like it is real. And whether you agree or disagree, that doesn't matter if you treat it like it's real. Because I can't tell you what to do. I don't know your communities, your lands, your people. You are the ones who will do it. And you are the ones who will come up with your own. So if I go back to Norway, feeling that oh, maybe one or two people might have been inspired to do something. That's a success, you know? Uh, if you guys do it, that's how I personally would measure your success. So, go out there. I mean, I like to say, Okay, this is the second 
of the Ponave workshops. I am talking to the next generation of rural entrepreneurs in the Czech Republic. Watch out. So we are going to propose building a network of rural entrepreneurs and communities. And we hope that if we build a network like that, all of you people would want to somehow be a part of it and to contribute. So watch this. Like, like I said, you know, we can do one-day workshops on how to fill out government grant forms. Or, a, you know, you're an expert. You can come and talk because you had one. Then. Oh, you could do that. We can share it all. And we can make information available, like the latest funding. Because we'll start a website. Facebook, Facebook, Twitter, of course. And you can then say, oh, look at what my name is doing. So if we did that, would you like to would you like to see is that something that would be of use to you? Okay, well if, if we build it, they'll come. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're we're gonna be doing this tomorrow. This we're gonna do the funding application tomorrow. So watch this go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Já bych jenom poděkoval všem lektorům, poděkoval znovu vám, poděkoval za uh, vyplnění dotazníků, protože jsou určitě pro nás užitečné, protože opravdu naprosto souhlasím, co už to tam překladoval a něco, že prostě uh, teorie akademická a praxe jsou dvě rozdílné věci a musíme se dále prostě tomu přizpůsobit. Díky, díky moc Rysovi za celé vlastně iniciaci tohoto kurzu a všem, kteří se do toho zapojovali, není tady pan doktor Slavko, aby mu poděkoval, protože toto prostředí a doufám, že kdyby se dobře něco takového dělá příště, mm. že už bude i s tím ubytováním, chápu, že některé ubytování hostů tady není, není prostě ideální, ale Lucie dělala, co mohla, prostě tady je to hrozně obtížné s ubytováním. A tý, já bych vás jenom poprosil, kdybychom zkusili udělat family photo venku. Možná s hrničkama, rychle, ven a uděláme to. Když se přebrátíme. Když se přebrátíme.